Sure. Um, thank you. So on behalf of MITAC, the MIT Activities Committee, I um, want to welcome you to um, the Brattle Bookshop talk today with Ken Gloss. He's the proprietor of the Brattle Bookshop, um, which is um, a very historic bookshop. It's been around since 1825. Um, and uh, Ken is a frequent appraiser on the um, Antiques Roadshow. And he'll talk a little bit about some of the great things at the Brattle Bookshop and also some interesting um, MIT anecdotes. Um, so uh, I will have Ken um, take us away to the, the bookshelves of the Brattle uh, Bookshop. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, what I'll do in a talk is I'll talk for about a half an hour or so. I'll talk about um, first editions, what is a first edition, sign books. I'll give some history and background. I'll, I have a little bit of show and tell here. I'll also uh, tell some stories, anecdotes of people, places, and so on that I've been. And then what I'd like to do after that is question and answer because I can go on and on and on and on about old books. And at least with question and answer, I can go on with what you might want to listen to. Uh, I do appraisals usually when I do live talks. If someone does have a book and want to turn on the video, I'd be happy to do that at the end. If not, you can always email, send pictures. Uh, you know, we're happy to do it and we do it all day long. In any case, uh, let me start. I guess one of the first things that comes up when you talk about old books is what is an old book? And usually people mean by that, what's a valuable old book? Well, the first printed book was in 1456, the Gutenberg Bible. If any of you have a Gutenberg Bible, let me assure you that it's valuable. Matter of fact, the last time one sold, half of it went for five and a half million dollars. Single pages sell between 50 and $100,000 on average, some even more. But any book printed in the 1400s is valuable, some more than others, but anything in the 1400s. After that, depends on what the book is. You can have a book printed in the 1500s that was a relatively dull and uninteresting book then, and it's still a relatively dull and uninteresting book now, and nobody cares we'll pay anything for it. On the other hand, you can have relatively recent books. The first edition of the first Harry Potter book in London, which is what, only a little over 20 years old, has sold for upwards of $100,000. So it's all what people are looking for. And I get loads of people come into the store or when I do talks uh, and will say, I have an old book and I know it's an old book. And the way I know it's old is the pages are all brown and crumbling. Well, I like to point out that's more lousy paper than it is how old the book is. Now, normally in a talk, I would pass this around, but you can see it's not terribly fragile. The paper is white, the ink's black. It's one of the first books done with illustrations. This was printed in the 1490s. So this page is a little over 500 years old. And you sort of say to yourself, gee, if they could make a book like that then, why don't they do it now? Well, there was a big disadvantage to a book like that. First of all, in the 1490s, you had to be quite wealthy to, to get an education to learn how to read. You had to be almost nobility to be able to afford to buy a book like this. Nowadays, maybe the books aren't quite as well made, but they're at a price that can be distributed in the millions. And the real value of books is the knowledge in the books and the dissemination of that knowledge. And I think it's a very good trade-off. Whenever book collecting comes up, somebody will come and say, I have a first edition. How much is it worth? And I point out that most first editions never came out in a second edition, probably never should have come out in a first edition. Nobody wants them, cares about them, or, or would pay anything whatsoever. A book has to be historically, scientifically, literarily, and for some other reason important that there are a group of collectors out there who want it. And usually when you think of first editions, you think of literature, Dickens, Twain, Falcon, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, and so on. And even within that, there are a lot of things that can make a big difference in the price. The condition being one of the most important. The paper dust 
jacket on a 20th century book can make all the difference in the world. My father had a copy of William Faulkner's second book called Mosquitoes. Absolutely pristine, as if someone took it from the publisher, sealed it away. At the time my father got it, he sold it within a week at $750. At the exact same time, another book dealer in the Boston area had the same book, first edition, Faulkner, Mosquitoes, didn't have the paper jacket, had tiny little nicks on it, nothing terrible. It took them a year to sell it at $40. Because a lot of collecting is prestige. It's bad to say, look what I have. I have the best, I have the most wonderful. Essentially, I have what you don't have, and people who can afford it will pay absolute top dollar for the very, very best. Other things that can affect the value, signed by the author. Well, once again, if the author is unknown, unheard of, the fact that it's signed might not mean that much. On the other hand, if it's signed by someone famous, maybe Ernest Hemingway, that could add hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. Um, we just recently had a, a, a signed copy, first edition of Cybernetics by Norbert Wiener. I mean, the great MIT professor. Uh, that it sells in the two to three thousand dollar range now and it's not that old but it's an incredibly important book by someone very important in the field a matter of fact my uncle went to mit and he had norbert norbert wiener as a professor and i remember when i was young before i had any clue who he was my uncle said he was the definition of an absent-minded professor he said sometimes he'd be on the bus going to him and my uncle would have to tell him where to get off the bus. Somehow though, he always made it. In, in any case, uh, there are some authors, there's all sorts of nuances that can add or subtract to the value. And I use sign books to show that off. There are some authors that are almost impossible to get their signature. J.D. Salinger, for instance, who wrote Catcher in the Rye. He was reclusive, he lived up in New Hampshire. He didn't sign books. Uh, didn't other than to very close personal friends and thus his signature adds thousands of dollars to the value. Uh, and matter of fact there, there was a story we actually hired and this is 40 years ago I hired uh, a man to work at the store when I was there full-time. His father at the time I don't think was a professor at MIT he was the head of the chemistry department at Dartmouth but he had been a prominent professor at MIT. His last name was Stockmeyer. But in any case, uh, an older man comes into the store, was looking for an obscure author named Donifred Yates. I knew who it was, fortunately. Went up to the fiction section, looked, we didn't have anything. And I said uh, to the man, I said, no, we don't have anything. At that time, we used to keep wants on card files. I said, would you like to fill out a card? We let you know when some comes in. He leaves, he said, no, I really don't want to, but I'll check again. He leaves and my new assistant who had worked there a week comes up to me and says, does that man come in here often? And I said, you know, I really wasn't paying attention, but no, I, I don't recognize him. He goes, oh, well, that was J.D. Salinger. I used to date his daughter. So sometimes it's the people who work for you and the characters. As a matter of fact, Hugh, uh, when he worked, for us for about a month, I had extra tickets to a Celtics game. It was my wife and I were going and we had two extra tickets. We said, Hugh, would you like to go to the game? And this is a case of one of the best or most, I should say, most memorable introductions that I've ever had. He says, yeah, but give me the tickets. I'll meet you there. My wife and I get there a little before the game. Hugh, our new employee, is sitting there with a woman and we walk in and he goes, oh, I'd like you to meet my wife, Mickey. We're getting divorced tomorrow. So you never know. Sometimes it's the people who work for us who are the characters. Uh, there are also now from, uh, uh, there are also some authors that are not as rare to get. There was a local author, a character, it was a friend of my father named Edward Rose Snow. Some of you might know who he was, but he wrote wonderful ghost, sea, pirate, buried treasure stories of the New England coast. And I remember he told us once, and, and I knew him, he had just gone into a bookstore on Cape Cod and Snow went right up to the section where his books were, pulled one off the shelf, opened it up and exclaimed, my, 
a rare unsigned copy. And then he pulled out a pen and signed it, closed it, it uh, put it back on the shelf, went up to the owner and introduced himself. So book signed by Edward Rose Snow Aunt is rare. Um, my father one time had a copy of F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic, The Great Gatsby. It was a first edition, but just opposite what I was saying, it, it didn't have the paper dust jacket. It was well worn and read. But when you opened it up, it was inscribed to the greatest living poet, T.S. Eliot, sincerely F. Scott Fitzgerald. And then when T.S. Eliot read it, he annotated, made marginal notes, crossed things out, added things into just about every page of the book. That book now would be worth two, three, maybe even $400,000 because of the association. One last story about sign books. There was an autograph and manuscript dealer in Massachusetts, one of the most prominent in the world. But when he was a young boy, he used to collect books by Robert Frost. And he knew Robert Frost. And when he was 13 years old, he went to London and he bought a copy of Frost's first book called The Boy's Will. Very, very complicated, what really is the first edition. Paid a lot of money for it at the time. Um, and then uh, came back to Boston. A few weeks later, he met with Frost. He was very proud of himself. He said, look what I've got. Frost looked at it, said, what did you pay for it? And he told him, and Frost said, give me the book. Frost opened it up in the front two end papers, wrote a two page description of how to tell the first binding from the second binding, from the third binding, from the fourth, how they change bindings, why they change bindings, the different colors of the bindings, on and on and on for two pages, signed it, closed it, handed it back to the boy and said, now it's worth what you paid for it. In, in any case, uh, let me digress, give you a little bit of the background of the history of the store and the Brattle Bookshop and myself. The history does go back to the 1820s, but for all practical purposes, it was going out of business in 1949. My father was getting married, my mother had $500. With that, they bought half interest in the Brattle Bookshop. And it's always been in Boston. Um, there was a little side street in what was Scully Square called Brattle Street. Uh, the street doesn't even exist anymore. It's where Boston City Hall Plaza is now. Um, and my father had seven different locations over the years. And he built the store because of his love of books, his hard work, his knowledge. He was also a character and a showman. And every time he would move when it was planned, he would move his best, he would run sales, 50 cent quarter dime and so on, run, have the best books at the new location. And then at the end of the sale, everything was free. And he would literally have hundreds of people line up with bags, packs, satchels, whatever, ring a big bell, people go charging into the store, grab whatever they could grab. Five minutes later, he'd ring the bell again, that group would leave, the next group would come in, and he gave away over 250,000 books that way. Now, the last time he did this was in 1969, we were moving from the end of Washington Street to West Street, where we are now. And at the end of the giveaway, there were books left over. And like I said, my father was a bit of a character and showman. And if you can picture this, he hired a covered wagon with a cowboy and a horse team. And on the cover of the covered wagon, it said, go West book lovers, go five West Street Brattle Bookshop. They filled it up with books and they drove it from the end of Washington Street up Court Street, down Tremont by the Boston Garment to West Street and back down Washington with my father sitting in back, throwing books out the whole way. Now, the superintendent in charge of traffic was a friend of his, told him he could do it all morning. But within an hour, the city was in an absolute standstill. He, they told him to stop. He didn't care. He'd gotten his point across. And we've been on West Street since then. When we first moved on to the street, we were in a five-story, 150-year-old wooden building crammed full of books. In February of 1980, I got a call at four in the morning. The building was on fire and it literally burnt to the ground. I mean, it was 100% gone. Uh, we had very little insurance, but we wanted to keep going, not go out of business. We found a storefront a few doors up the street. We rented folding table, tables. People either sold, gave us, donated books. Kevin White, who was the mayor at the time, came down with a carload of books. Uh, within a month, we reopened. It was meager stock, but it was just continued to keep going. Uh, four years after that, we bought the building we're in now. Again, just a few doors down on West Street. 
And it's sort of the old Dickensian type of store. Outside stands at a dollar, three and five, two floors with general use books, a third floor with rare books, autographs, manuscripts, leather bindings, and so on. And that type of business is a dying business. And it's not dying because people don't like books, buy books, read books, sell books, but property value has gone so high, that rent has gone so high, especially in the inner cities, that old bookstores, which I can assure you are not the most efficiently run businesses in the world, one right after the other have going out of business. And the internet has just speeded that process along. Um, but I, I've been doing this pretty much all my life. My parents say my first word was book. I worked after elementary school, and I'm sure they were talking about them all the time. Worked after school in elementary school, junior high school, high school, summers during college. I actually have a degree in chemistry from the University of Massachusetts. I was going to get a doctoral degree at the University of Wisconsin, but in 1973, I needed a year off. My father wasn't that well. That year now is over 40 years, and I don't regret for a minute that I'm doing this and not in a laboratory somewhere. I have daughters who are in their 30s. I don't think they're going to come into it the same way that I did. Uh, but I plan on living forever, so it's not a problem. Um, if you would ask me, what's one item that I wish I could find? It's a little pamphlet here called Tamerlane by a Bostonian. It was done in 1827. It doesn't look like very much, but the Bostonian who did this was Edgar Allan Poe. It's a classic rarity in American literature. <laughs> the first copy to actually ever really be found was in Boston on a dealer's 10 cent table. Another dealer in 1890, another dealer found it, bought a stack of books so it wouldn't stand out. And in 1890, sold it for $1,000. Then in the 1950s, there were two postmen in the New Bedford area who on the side were book scouts. And being postmen, they knew where all the yard sales were went to a yard sale, bought, him, bought a trunk of books, bottom of the trunk is a Tamerlane. Families got involved, they got to negotiating. After six months, they sold it for $10,000. I don't know if it was worth it. They started out best of friends. By the time they sold it, they never spoke again, but they got their $10,000. 20, 25 years ago, an antique dealer died in the Newburyport area. Whole estate was auctioned, antiques, paintings, prints, whatever. Um, books as a group, $600 to an antique dealer in New Hampshire. They put all the pamphlets in a box, $15 each. Someone, of course, picked out a Tamerlane. 20 years ago, sold it for $198,000. And one sold a few years ago for $800,000. And unfortunately, let me just say, this is a facsimile. A lot of the things I do have are originals. I unfortunately don't have a million dollar pamphlet. But anyone watching, if you go down and check your attic, cellars, basements, whatever, uh, if you find one, give me a call. I'd love to hear about it. A lot of the fun of collecting is learning about something, is studying it, is appreciating it. It's really your knowledge that makes something interesting and thus valuable. I mean, someone might look at something and say, oh, that's a scrap of paper. Someone else might say, that's a broadside that led to the American Revolution, that led to our country's independence, that, you know, so you never know what it is. Uh, and here's one that on the surface is interesting. I'll, I'll end up reading this. On the surface is interesting, but the story behind it is even more so. It's on White House stationery. It's dated April 11th, 1933, and it starts, Dear Jim, I want to send you this note to tell you how happy I am that you are to represent the United States in Poland. It's the most important post, signed et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, signed Franklin Roosevelt, and it's to the Honorable James Michael Curley, Mayor of Boston. Now on the surface, this seems like a great honor. It's an ambassadorial appointment. Curley didn't think it was such an honor. Matter of fact, I think he thought Roosevelt was trying to get rid of him, which of course he probably was. And Curley's response to Roosevelt was, remember this was 1933, he said in Poland, with Germany on one side, Russia on the other, you should send your worst Republican enemy to Poland. He said, matter of fact, if you think it's so important, why don't you quit and go there yourself? 
Now, Curley's impression of Washington didn't change over the years. At the store, we also have 10 letters he wrote to his wife when he was in Danbury Prison. Now, even though these were personal letters, he was still very much the politician. And there was one quote I particularly liked. He had just gotten into prison. He wrote to his wife and he said, many of the four-legged creatures in my cell have more honor than the two-legged creatures in Washington. In any case, enough, enough of Curley. Uh, other things that I have, we don't get just books, but we get brochures, uh, paper items. Here's a program from the 1912 World Series. Uh, the Red Sox won the World Series in 1912, a few more times in the teens, and we had to wait a long, long time. My only fear is they've won a few, they've won a few times, and I just hope we don't have to wait a long time since. But this is the original program for the 1912 World Series. On the back, there's an ad for arrows, shirts, and collars. Collars are two for a quarter, shirts are a dollar and a half and two dollars. Cruise ships are a little bit, they're a little bit questionable right now. Up until six months ago, it was very popular to go on cruise ships. I think I'll wait for a vaccine to go uh, on the next one. But this might be just as much of a challenge. Here's an original brochure for the Titanic. I, I don't know which is safer, uh, but almost anything you can think of, there are people out there who are interested and there are whole societies of Titanic historians who do nothing but study the Titanic. So if you want to book passage, this tells you where and how to get tickets. Uh, one last thing to show off. There's a tendency that whenever you talk about books and book collecting, everything all of a sudden turns out to be worth thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And I'd like to point out, not everything has to be high priced to be fun. Old Life magazines, for instance. Here's one with Errol Flynn on the cover. Another with Elizabeth Taylor when she was 15 years old. The large, large majority of these sell for a few dollars at best. I mean, there are a few exceptions, but they don't sell for a lot. But we used to have a display of these hanging on a wall by a stairway at the store, maybe 100, 200 of the more famous lights. And people would stop and stare at that wall sometimes half an hour, an hour at a time, lost in thought and memory. They loved them for the stories, the articles, the photographs, made wonderful birthday or anniversary presents if you fell on the right day. And we had a regular customer come in and he bought about 50 Life magazines from World War II and it wasn't what he normally bought. So I said to him, why are you buying these? He said, well, I want to teach my children about World War II when he thought a nice way to do it would be to get some of the old lives, tell some of the stories, read some of the articles, read the, uh, look at the photographs and then discuss it with his children. This is an idea. There's a lot of homeschooling going on now. And he thought, and you know, I thought, gee, that sounds interesting, fun. I was a little skeptical. He came in a few weeks later and I said to him, how's it going with the lives? He said, fabulously, but not the way I thought. He says the kids don't care about the stories, the articles, the photographs but they love the ads. And he says that it turns out by looking at and discussing the ads with them, he could probably teach them more about what the United States was like during World War II than if they had uh, gotten everything uh, and read everything else. Uh, so you never know. Um, I'll tell, one of the most interesting parts about the business for me is going out to houses and estates. That's how we get most of our books. It's almost like being Jim Hawkins on Treasure Island, every day knowing, not knowing who you're gonna meet, the people, the places, the characters. I'll relate three or four of those stories, then I'll give you a few sort of MIT stories to go along with the uh, location. And then I always have more, I, actually I do a podcast called Brattlecast. Uh, I'm gonna record the hundredth one next week. But if you like the stories, I've got a million of them. Uh, in any case, uh, this was a number of years ago. I was out of the store. I got back. There was a Mrs. Fisher had called. And I called her back. And she says, oh, yes, my father died in Providence. He has 500 art reference books. We're having a number of dealers down to bid on them. Would you be interested? Well, 500 art reference books sounded like a good library. 
Providence is only an hour away. We've gone way, way far, further than that. Um, and I said, sure, they lived on an old street called Benefit Street up near Brown University. Got to the house, it was a large old colonial house. Got led through the house into a courtyard, into a garage. Uh, it, second floor of the garage, they had 5,000 books. Well, it turned out her married name was Fisher. Her father's name was John Nicholas Brown. Family founded Brown University, one of the wealthier families in the country. And after about eight months, I bought most of the books I wanted. I was happy, she was pleased. And she said, my mother has a lot of books. Most are being given to the university. Some are being sold at auction, but would you like to go to Newport to take a look at the books there? Well, their house in Newport is one of the mansions on the ocean. I mentioned this to my wife. She decided to come with me on this deal. And it was fascinating to be in one of those mansions that was still being lived in by a family. And at one point, wandering from the basement to the attic, all on my own, without a tour guide saying, come here, go here, don't touch this, but just wandering through the whole place, it was fascinating. Another time I got called to uh, Newport to do an appraisal. Now, when I do appraisals for groups like this, or if anyone gets in touch with me, I do hundreds of free appraisals. Matter of fact, my goal is that whenever you think of an old book, you think of me in the Brattle Bookshop. I don't care if you think of 10 others, just as long as I'm one of the 10. And one of the ways I feel I can do that is by giving away as much free information as reasonable. But there are times when people need very formal written appraisals for insurance, estate taxes, and I discuss a fee. In any case, another mansion in Newport, not quite as big as the Browns. This was the Perry family, Commodore Perry, uh, Oliver Hazard Perry. And what they had was a whole stack of papers from the War of 1812. During the war, their family were privateers. Well, they're par privateers if you're on our side. They're pirates if you're on the other side. It's all the way you look at it. It was the day-to-day -day accountings of the ships. They were fascinating to read through. They would sometimes capture a ship and realize tens of thousands of dollars profit. I mean, in 1812, that was an incredible amount of money. Then one of the days, one of the uh, ships got into a battle. The ship got hit. The captain got hit. He lost his leg. Three days later, there was a tiny entry at the bottom of a page, and it said, Captain, $5 bonus, loss of leg. And that was the last you heard of the captain. Um, when my father was still alive, and he died over 35 years ago, we got a call from a lady. She was very vague about her name, who she was, what she had. She lived close by in Sharon. It, it sounded like there might be something, so we went out. Got to her house, it was a little ranch house, paint was peeling, weeds were growing. And you know, you say, oh gee, what's gonna be here? She answered the door, she was elderly. We walk in and there were just gorgeous antiques everywhere. I mean, really, really beautiful antiques. And she got to talking. It turned out she was from the Boston area, but she had married the prince of the Ukraine, the cousin of the Tsar of Russia. He had escaped just before the revolution. And she told story after story about being Russian nobility in Europe, all the court intrigues, all the goings on, how T.E. Shaw used to stay at their house all the time, how she didn't think he accidentally died on a motorcycle, but there was a lot more to it. T.E. Shaw, of course, was Lawrence of Arabia. And she went on and on and on with these wonderful stories. Turned out her books were lousy, but the stories were absolutely wonderful. And when we first got into her house, she had 10 watercolors on the wall. They were sort of pastoral European scenes. When we first got in, I looked at them. I thought they were nice. The more she talked and the longer we were there and the more I looked at them, the nicer I thought they were. And I finally said to her, you know, those 10 watercolors, they're nice. And she turned around and said, oh yes, they were all Turners. So she had 10 original Turner watercolors, probably a million dollars worth of paint. It was all like, and you know, just, oh yes, they're all, so you never know who you're gonna meet, the people, the places, the characters. As a matter of fact, uh, speaking of characters, uh, about 20 or so years ago, we went to one of our customers' 100th birthday parties. Now, when you go to a man's 100th birthday party, and he tells you he just gave a talk in Barcelona, he's scheduled to give a talk in Florida, and he's been asked to lecture in Tokyo. And I finally said to him, wait a minute, you're 100 years old. Don't you think Tokyo is an awfully long way to go? And he said, well, when I used to work, it took me well over 25 hours to get to Chicago. 
says, I don't think Tokyo is a whole lot further than that nowadays. And here's the man who can tell you about one day sitting down to dinner with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. And he said, he obviously was a much younger man, said he was looking forward to this dinner and all the learning and insight he was going to get from these two men. And he was looking forward to it. He was excited. He said he got to the table a little early. He said a few minutes later, Ford came in and sat down next to him. And about 15 minutes later, Edison came in. Now, Edison was quite elderly, one of those big, big horns for hearing. Said he sat down opposite them and he said the first thing Ford turned to Edison and yelled, my Tom, you look very good. And he said, Edison turned to Ford and yelled, it's the Cotter's little liver pills. This man said all night long, all they did was yell about Cotter's little liver pills. And he said, next time he wanted to learn something, he went to the library. Now I can go on and on and on with these stories. I'll tell one more that I normally tell. And then I'm, I'll talk about a few things uh, and people and MIT and so on. Uh, we get hundreds of phone calls at the store. People want to know, do you have a book? Can you get a book? How hard is it to get the book? Does the book exist? Most of those questions, either I or the people I work with, we can answer right off the top of our head. Some are a little more involved and occasionally you really have to do some research. And that can be fun too, but every once in a while you get a call that really stands out. Again, this was a while ago, but I answered the phone, hello, Brattle Bookshop, can I help you? Lady, elderly, thick Irish brogue, and the first thing she says is, President Kennedy slept with me. Now I have to admit that gets your attention. She stopped and waited for it to sink in. And then she went on to explain that she had worked for the Kennedy family. And she had been his nursemaid. And when he was two and three years old, he used to fall asleep in her arms. So he did sleep with her, but maybe not what you first think. And what she had was a whole series of handwritten letters from the president. And um, she wanted to get an offer on them. I was very skeptical about that, but I thought she'd be fun to meet. I went there. She had great stories, wonderful. I looked at the letters. I thought they were fabulous. I gave what I thought was a tremendous offer much as I suspected though. No way she could sell these letters. Those are part of her life. I left a note behind. As far as I know, her family still has them probably where they belong. In any case, in <coughs> uh, speaking of presidents, over the years, uh, I've been called, I did appraisals for um, Killian, Howard Johnson, Stratton. And what, you know, it was simple enough. Uh, it, they were uh, giving their papers to where else? MIT. And uh, went over their papers, worked out an appraisal. Um, the fun, in most of the cases, I got to meet them and actually talk. I mean, that was just a lot of fun. Like I say, my uncle uh, went to MIT back when I think tuition was maybe $50 uh, before he went in the service before World War II. Uh, and it was an interesting thing with my uncle. He was studied electrical engineering at MIT, but what he really wanted to be was a musician. And one of the reasons he studied electrical engineering, he felt my grandmother would not allow him to be a musician because you're never going to make money. She might have been right, she might not have, but he thought maybe the closest thing he could get was electrical engineering and sound and all of that. He ended up working for uh, Raytheon and then Lincoln Labs. Uh, specialized in lasers, measuring the distance to the moon within inches. Uh, but so in the family, uh, that's one. Uh, and then I remember one time I got a call from Jerome Letvin to, uh, he wanted his papers appraised, but I had to go to his laboratory. And boy, was that a lot of fun. First of all, finding anything on MIT is a challenge just the way the buildings and the numbers. And, and of course he was out back in one of those little World War II sheds almost. And there were things piled on top of piled on top. And you knew great science was going on in this lab. I mean, it was fabulous. And he was telling all sorts of stories. There were great stories. I have no idea what he was talking about, but they were fabulous stories in any case, just by the way he told them. And I did the uh, appraisal. Uh, one time, an, another time, I had to do an appraisal for Noam Chomsky. Uh, he was, um, that's when he was retiring. Uh, he was moving his office. He was giving some books to a library. He needed, he needed an appraisal. 
Uh, it was a lot of fun. I even got to go to his house in Cape Cod uh, and talk, meet, talk to his wife more than I talked to him. Uh, and one of the things that people ask me, because I was a chemistry major, and, and actually, I'll brag a little, uh, I published a paper when I was an undergraduate. Uh, so I, at least I felt I would have had a career if I wanted. But um, it, one of the things, though, that it did do for me, when I get called in by scientists to look at mathematics or physics libraries or whatever, I'm not intimidated. A lot of used book dealers, you get into the sciences, and it's just intimidating. Years ago, we got called uh, into Carlisle, Massachusetts, for a place called the Park Mathematical Laboratory. Park was a very famous mathematician, wrote bibliographies about math. There was about four or 5,000 scholarly mathematic books, not rare, but scholarly, and nobody wanted to deal with them. What it was is they wanted to get the space because computers were taking everything over. And I ended up buying the collection, did fabulously well. Here's one, one question that comes up, and I'm gonna sort of give a, a little idea, and then I'm gonna tell the one that I think would interest MIT people. A lot of times you get called in and there's just something special. And, and I have whole pages and pages that now what I collect is little stories that I can tell. And I write one sentence, one line. I Actually, it might be two or three stories. But uh, I got called once and someone said, uh, I have something unusual, but it's scientific. It's very rare. And so on. He says, uh, my father was a scientist in uh, White Sands, New Mexico. And when they dropped the first atomic bomb, he was, went right to ground zero and got a test tube full of the dirt. And he says, and I want to be able to get that evaluated and maybe sell it. It's a great scientific item. And I, and I told him on the phone, do not bring in a, a test tube filled with radioactive dirt. I said, don't, please don't. And I could not convince him that there might be an issue about dirt that was at ground zero that the atomic bomb fell on, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Couldn't convince him of it at all. I said, check somewhere else. No, don't bring it in. Uh, a lot of times I do museum appraisals and I do them for free because I wanna help a museum. Uh, recently, there was a wonderful exhibit at Boston College of illuminated manuscripts. Um, Maybe many of you don't know it, but you have a great library of some rare books at MIT and you have some, a few really nice illuminated manuscripts. So I got called in, went to the library, fabulous manuscript that went into that Boston College collection and uh, the exhibit was fabulous. This was for another museum. I got called and they wanted an appraisal. We were able loaning something from one to another. And I said, yep, I'll do the appraisal for free. Uh, but I don't want to do it from a copy from some, I, I want to see and hold the original. Four page handwritten account of Paul Revere's ride by Paul Revere. And you're sitting there holding four pages that Paul Revere wrote about two weeks after his ride <coughs> that he actually, and you know, when you touch something that Paul Revere wrote on, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Albert Einstein, a whole series, even though I deal in this, you touch that and there's that connection, it sends a chill up your spine. <clears throat> this, this last story that I'll tell and then I'll see you about some questions is I got called and I don't know whether I'm gonna be doing this university a favor or not by telling people this to a degree. I, I got called to do an appraisal um, out at uh, a college in the area. And one of the books they had was the first edition of Principia Mathematica, Isaac Newton's great work, very fabulous. But it was Isaac Newton's copy that he wrote notes in, that he wrote his name in. This was, I got to touch and hold Isaac Newton's copy of Principia Mathematica. Um, I mean, just, it was fabulous. Now, what people also don't realize at this college, they also had Isaac Newton's study. I mean, the actual room. Uh, Roger Babson, 
was very wealthy uh, industrialist and investor. He has a college name after him, but he was a devotee of Isaac Newton and collected letters, documents, books, and had bought Isaac Newton's study. So in a building at Babson College is Isaac Newton's study. Bet you most people didn't know that. But this Principia Mathematica, Babson College couldn't really properly store the collection and it ended up in the Dibner collection, which was at MIT for years. And, um, and uh, the, the curator of the collection, Ben Weiss, was a good friend and, uh, of Oz. Um, he's now at the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, and again, to pull in the MIT collection uh, connection, his father recently won the uh, Nobel Prize for gravitational waves. See, we can connect everything around here. Uh, and one of the great stories Ben told me about that is he said, you know, they can actually have a dinner, catered dinner for 1,500 people and the food's good. He said the Nobel Committee somehow pulls that off. That might be as much of a challenge as winning a Nobel Prize. But in any case, so this copy went from Babson to the Dibnick Collection at MIT to then it is now sitting in the Huntington Library in California where the Dibner Collection went. Uh, last year, before the pandemic, I went to a book show in Pasadena and I said to my wife, one of the first things we have to do is go to the Huntington Library. I wanna to go to the rare book area, the displays. And we looked at the glass case and there was the Principia of Mathematica, uh, Newton's crop. They wouldn't let me touch it though. I don't know why they wouldn't take it out and let me just, uh, even though I've done it once. So almost anything, I, I think the great thing about books and old books and collecting, or almost any book that's ever done, there's a reason why people do it. There's a story behind it. And uh, you know what I'll say now is I can go on and on and on. I'm gonna end the talk with a couple of other quick stories, maybe talking about the Antiques Roadshow a little, but if anyone has any questions, uh, I don't know if there are any have come up, but I'd be happy to try to answer those or I'll just keep going. <laughs> are there any? Uh, not quite yet, but okay. we'll, we'll let you know if some come in. Well, I'll tell you what then, uh, we've got another 15 minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll tell a few stories about uh, things. One, one of the questions that comes up a lot is do I collect anything? No, I don't really. When I was growing up, my father used to bring home three, four, five books a day. Do that for 40 years. And you can imagine what our house looked like. And it wasn't really a collection. It was more than an accumulation. And he would mean to read a title, a, a copy, an introduction or whatever. But there were piles and piles and heaps of books. I read a lot. I read local history. I read books about books and book collecting. I'll read Stephen King. I'll read John Grisham uh, for Beach. Uh, but I don't really collect. I bring them back because I don't want that accumulation. But there is one collection that started as an accident or actually as a joke. I got a book in once. Well, here, I'll, I'll show the type. This is a 19th century book. And a lot of books from this period had very decorative covers. And the reason they had decorative covers is if you walk into a bookstore and the book catches your eye, there's more chance you'll buy it. And before they widely used dust jackets, a lot of books were like this. And there were people who collect books like this just for the decorative covers. And uh, one day I got a book in, and you can get them cheaply. You, I mean, you can pay a lot of money, but you can go to yard sales, book sales, bookstores, auctions, and pick them up cheaply. Anyways, one day I got a copy of a book, had a picture of a toilet on the cover. The title was Flushed with Pride, The Life of Thomas Crapper, Who Invented the Toilet. Took one look at it, said I brought it home. My wife looked at it and said, we have to put that in the bathroom. So we did. A Couple of days later, I got another book and had a big eye staring out of the cover. The title was We Never Sleep, History of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. But with a big eye staring at you, I thought, ah, oh, put that in the bathroom too. Now this is a little half bathroom with a no, um, <coughs> no shower, no steam. Next thing you know, we built bookshelves and now we have about 400 of these Victorian style illustrated books in our bathroom. People walk in, they're a little taken aback. 
but loads of reading material. And one of the rules of the collection is that nothing can be valuable is every once in a while a book falls off the shelf. You can imagine where it ends up in any case. Um, do we have a few, uh, have a few uh, questions coming in? And we, like I said, I'll end on one or two last stories. Uh, we have a few questions from the chat. Uh, sure. First up from Ruth. Why are some books on the internet overpriced? A faculty member asked me to get linear programming in infinite dimensional spaces, theory and applications, John Wiley and Sons, 1987. And it was listed for $1,000. Well, I, I will blame some of the scientists at MIT for some of that. Why not? I mean, you're, you're they're listening. Might as well put it somewhere. But a, a couple of things. First of all, on the internet, there is no editing. There is no process. There is no anything uh, as that. So sometimes what I tell people when you're trying to get a feel for what a book should be worth, the first thing to look at is not the price. It's how many are available. And if there are 100 available, that tells you immediately that there are 100 online that haven't sold. And usually it brings it to the low, lower value. So usually it brings it down. But a lot of these, there are companies who sell books on the internet. And the way they do it is they scan the ISBN or the name. And there are programs that then pick up immediately what it is, cattle, tell what the book is, and so on. And their definition of an old book, and I've had people tell me this, is anything prior to ISBN. Because if it's prior to ISBN, then you actually have to look at the book and scan in a name. But the, one of the other things those programs do is they'll have algorithms to price the books. So in other words, no person is pricing this. It's some genius computer person who created an algorithm. The algorithm will go online, check out how many other copies there are. If there aren't any, and it seems very rare, they'll price it very, very high. So let's say it's $1,000 and it should be 50 maybe. Well, it will sit there for a certain amount of time, depending on the algorithm, or someone else looks at it, wait a minute, $1,000, that seems much, but I've got another copy. I'll put it on a 300 and it will sell fast. Still too high, but then the algorithm will see, wait a minute, that's one on a 300. I'll put ours at two, 299 and that will keep going and going until you finally buy it, or someone is so desperate. So it's not even a person in, in a lot of those cases who's doing it, it's a computer, and uh, you just sort of see what happens. So that is sometimes one of the explanations. <laughs> and every once in a while, someone is so desperate to come across that they actually pay it, but more often it's the algorithm. And these algorithms many times will reprice these large stocks every couple of minutes. So you're dealing with a computer. Uh, get a computer to defeat it. All right, what's the, what's the next right. one? Next one, what is the most valuable book in your store today, monetarily or otherwise? That one's well, from Ilda. Well, the, the most valuable book in the store right now um, is, it's a little different. Actually, just this morning, uh, we were going out and looking at some books and there was some Dow in there. If they turn out to be right, they could be quite valuable, but, uh, Probably one of the most valuable in stock now is we have some photographs that Edward Curtis uh, had of the American Indians back at the turn of the century. And that's probably in the $20,000, $25,000 range. The full set, which we have had long in the past, would sell for in the million dollar range. But sometimes, to me, sometimes the more interesting and most valuable book is something that I can tell a good story for. Uh, I, I one time got a book, a, a collection of cookbooks, a large, large collection. It was a really good collection. And there was a number of, uh, of these little pamphlets that came in, how to make jello, how to cook chocolate, how to do this. And I, some of them were worth a few dollars, some were worth 10 or 20, but it wasn't worth the time. I told one of my employees to put that out. Um, put it out and just at a dollar table and let people pick through and they'll get some bargains. 
about two hours after we did it, we had this man come running in, absolutely out of, he was just so beside himself. He said, I've been looking for this for years and years and years and haven't been able to find it. And I'm just so, so excited. It's only a dollar. I looked at it. The title was Coconuts and Constipation. I mean, you, you can't make that up. Well, another copy, this is 25 years later, just came in. I put it in my own little area for stories. For me, that's one of the most valuable books that's here now because it just reminds me of that situation and story. But um, what we have though is we have outside books at a dollar, three and five. We have two floors of probably 10 to $50. And then we have a third floor with rare books and autographs. And quite honestly, uh, sometimes we have books that are a few dollars and uh, we, uh, a year or so ago, we had a first edition of the Federalist Papers uh, that went for $150,000. So it all depends on the day and time. And one of the great things about used bookstores, ours and almost all of them, you never know what's going to be there. You never know what we've just bought, which estate we've been in. We just bought fourth, we're moving I was doing this this morning. I moved half the 4,000 books. The other people are getting the privilege of moving the other 2,000. But this is what we're doing day after day, and, and it's a lot of fun. So uh, value can be a lot of things. It can be the story, the book, the finding it, and it can be outright money value too. All right. Uh, any others? Yes, we have a, a few more questions, and then we have okay, a and then couple I'll end of on a people few, uh, who, who have some books to share. Okay, well, why don't we um, see what we can do? Yep, so next up, a question. Uh, there was an article in the Boston Globe about the Gloss slash Brattle curating books for Zoom backgrounds during the pandemic. <laughs> uh, got, got any stories about that? Maybe, maybe just a quick one to share since we have a, a number of things to get to. Uh, well, uh, it's interesting. I actually was just before this on GBH radio and they had interviewed me back in May about Zoom backgrounds and they wanted an update 10 minutes before I went on or a half an hour. Uh, this was sort of started when we were closed in March and April and so on. It was something that uh, we just thought of and we were looking at people doing these Zoom talks and, and what people don't realize is you're looking at the screen but people were looking and seeing what's behind you. And some of it was awful. So we made a few comments about it. The press picked it up. Uh, and then we started getting people saying, we, we want some Zoom backgrounds, which is part of, with me, old books. But sometimes it was, if you're a scientist, maybe you want some engineering books. Maybe you want something that personally means something. Or if someone asks you about it, you can tell them. Maybe you want to avoid books on marital problems, sex, and so on, and not have those in your background. So we still do it. And now that it's loosening just a bit, we also have a few movie companies who are shooting in Massachusetts who need sets for their uh, movies in particular types. Uh, one doing it on artificial intelligence, and we have to come up with what would be a background for a scientist in that. So we do do that. It's fun. It was more fun than profitable, but it was fun. All right. Um, and then uh, another question, do you ever buy a first edition of something new, speculating it might be valuable at a later date? I generally don't so much. I mean, one of the things that people ask me, essentially, do you buy for investment? Uh, we buy thousands of books. I mean, for us to be out almost every day looking at houses, estates, buying 4,000 books this morning, I have to look at 3,000 tomorrow. And just think about this part of it, and people don't think about this in the used bookstore. If you buy 1,000 books on a fifth floor walk-up in 95 degree weather, you have to carry 1,000 books out of a fifth floor walk-up in 90, it's incredibly physical. But no, generally I buy, and you know, I'll take a chance. In other words, I'll have something, and is it worth this much or that much, and I really like it, and I'll pay, you know, aggressively because I like it. But I always tell people, if you're buying for investment and predicting on the future, and if you can tell what the future is going to be, I highly advise lottery tickets because they're, they're more a sure bet if you can tell the future. So 
they, they, it's almost a cliche, but buy what you like, do what you ha have fun with that you want. Also, I also advise people um, that take a chance once in a while. Maybe something you think will be valuable. Almost everybody who's collected for a long time, they don't remember the ones that, um, what they remember are the ones that got away. They went into a store, they went someplace, they went to an auction, they didn't make that last bid, they thought it was slightly overpriced, they let it go. 30 years later, they don't have a copy of that book and all they can remember is they let it go. Uh, and sometimes they say, be willing to make a mistake because if you never make a mistake when you're buying by overpaying, it means you'll let so many things go that you should have bought, uh, but do it because you're enjoying it and having fun with it not because you're speculating on the price. All right. Okay. Um, why, why don't I tell one more quick, uh, one, let me go off. First of all, I okay. do Antiques Roadshow. I hope you all watch it. Uh, this season is a little bit strange, but we, we are taping some things that will come out next year. Uh, and it, it's a lot of fun. I mean, anywhere you go in this country, if you make any effort at all, it's beautiful. People are wonderful, just don't talk about politics and religion. But I, my last story, uh, we get calls uh, to go out to churches sometimes, a large old church in Boston. They called me out. They, uh, over uh, well over a hundred years, they had a huge library. They didn't collect rare books. They just wanted to know, did any turn out to be better? Spent a day there, it was great. They actually had some good books. At the end of the day, the priest said to me, can you come down the basement? There were a few more books. Went down, looked. And then there was a small room, or almost a small closet. Priest opened the door, front to back, top to bottom, floor to ceiling. It was stuffed with thousands of old Bibles. And I looked at the priest, I said, what is this? He says, well, people hate to throw away a book. They feel it's sacrilegious to throw away a Bible. So what happens? When a parishioner dies and the family doesn't want the Bible, they come and they present it to the church. And he says, what do we do? We very graciously accept it. We don't want to offend anybody. Then we go downstairs, open the door, put it in with the rest of them. And he says, and we can't drive a dumpster up to the back of the church and fill it full of Bibles. That just wouldn't be right. So I use it as an example to say, if you want to give something to a charity, ask them if they want it first. If they want it, it's great. If not, you're not doing anyone a favor. Uh, I'll end on, if anyone has books, they want to get an appraisal, they want to just get a quick verbal, I encourage you, Google Bridal Bookshop, all the, comp, uh, all the uh, connecting information is there. Send pictures, we do it all the time. I love doing it. Send a phone number, I'll talk. Um, and I also do a podcast called Brattlecast, 15, 20 minutes. This type of stories, uh, we're coming out with the hundredth one next, uh, probably next week. Uh, and if you have any questions about books, the problem when you ask someone a question and they love and like what they're doing is not getting an answer. It's getting them to stop answering. In any case, why don't I leave on that note? Thank you all and I appreciate it. Uh, just to end things off, we do have one pair of folks that do have a book that they are interested oh. in appraisal for. Do you have the time? Oh, I, I have the time. I mean, it's more on your end. So Excellent. Of course, if they we'll can hold it up so I can see it. Yeah, we'll switch over to them quickly. Um, and Stephanie, if you'd like to speak directly, let me sure. allow you how to speak. Hold on. I like the books <laughs> in the background. Hi. Hi, Stephanie. This is my husband, Brent. Hi. What, what's the book? So I, I, there's a little bit of the story to this. I, I work at- Okay, go ahead. I love stories. I work at MIT Lincoln Laboratory doing um, space stuff and like orbits and uh, satellites and spacecraft. And every year for a while, they were doing a kind of like a book donation sale. Yep. And probably back in 2012, I was just perusing and I, I found this copy of the Martian Chronicles because I, I thought it was really cool to have the orbits on the cover yep. and I just- and I noticed it's it's one of the early editions, you know, it says 1950, it's nothing, but it's got a book club edition. I don't yeah. really know what that means. 
I kind of got it because it was a pretty cover and I liked the book. And I was just curious if you knew anything about it. And um, I, I'm willing to hope that you didn't pay a whole lot for it. There, there, no, I, it was it was like a dollar. To be okay, well, <laughs> I mean, first of all, the Martian Chronicles is a great, great story. Uh, if you've been listening to the whole lecture, like I said, my uncle worked at Lincoln Laboratories a, a long time ago. And when they were using lasers to uh, map the moon within sec so Lincoln Laboratories, I'm well familiar with. Uh, what that book club means is a lot of times book club, it was a great way for selling books. It, you would join, they would send you selections. You, it, when you joined, you got free books, uh, usually as a bonus. But then you'd get each month they'd have, you'd order a book or two, and usually they were very good prices. Normally, when the book club put the book out, they would have a little bit cheaper paper, a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit smaller, and uh, they would sell millions of copies of the books. It was a great way to get books out to people with maybe they didn't have big bookstores, or, you know, it, it was an incentive. So book club editions tended to be slightly later editions of very popular books that were then sent over to the book club to get huge copies. But the minute you see that book club little mark on it, you know it's a book club edition. A collector knows it's not the first edition, so it's not, quote, the collectible one. But normally, mm -hmm. something like that, if we had it in the store, $10, $15. So it's still, you got a good bargain. But yeah. yeah. I, well, I like it because it's got the same cover as the first one, and I'm not going to buy a first edition of it. So. <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of times what they did is they just literally copied what the book was. And there are even cases where you see it's a book club edition, and, on, and this is varies among books, but sometimes a first edition on the copyright page will actually say first edition. But one of the difficult things is the book club many times would just literally copy everything. So you'd have a book club edition that says first edition, because they just copied that too. Uh, but no, I, I, and like I say, I collect, I have a collection of books just because the covers are fun. And that's sort of a little what you're inferring. Uh, I highly recommend, I love The Illustrated Man uh, by Ray Bradbury and the movie with Rod Steiger. So again, it maybe doesn't have orbitals on it, but uh, that's another one if you like Bradbury at all. Martian yeah. Chronicles, a fabulous movie also. Yeah, it's a, it's a great book. And it's, that cover is very pretty. <laughs> yeah, it, but it is a book club edition. So it is just a general reading copy. Thanks. Now I know. Yeah, thank you. Okay. We love and if you ever have any other questions, get in touch. OK. Thanks. Well, thanks so much, everybody. That's going to be the end of our recording, at least. If anybody does have any Hold on a minute. last questions. <laughs> I do. I have some school books from the 1800s. Okay. Uh, so one is called, you can see it. I can't uh, see it. Diane, you are going to want to turn, to turn, turn off your oh, no. <laughs> Hold on. Let me change my background. You're going to have to turn it off. That, that's all right. Just tell me what it is. And... It is called New Mental Arithmetic. Okay. Generally, uh, those type, you know, what's the date on it? I, something early, it's, it's 18, uh, 1873. Okay. Yeah. If you stop and think about this, by the 1870s, there were small schools, there were large schools and small schools all over the country. And they all had to have textbooks. So by that time, there were huge, huge numbers of these textbooks in every classroom and then for all this, sometimes one for the whole group, sometimes every student. Usually when you get to textbooks, especially in the United States, you have to almost get to the early 1800s, even the 1700s to, that, to have more collector's value. But what we found is a lot of them just sell for a few dollars. There's lots around, but people like them. We also usually keep a collection of a little bit more unusual or the ones in good condition because a lot of times people want to give a present to a teacher 
and $25 is usually to get a book in the 1870s, 1850s, and, and more, they say, we want a math book, we want an English book, we want a science book. So anywhere from that five to $25 is what they normally go for. If you told me you had to find a copy of that specific book, it could be very, very hard. But if you said, I want a math textbook from the 1870s, uh, we could say, do you want a truckload or do you want just a few? So they're relatively common and that's the price range. Um, the other one I wanted to show, it's very old. This is a spelling book from 1830. Uh, it, it also looks like someone did something on the other page of it. Uh, a lot of times the type of books that are in the poorest condition are cookbooks and children's books or because yeah. of the way they're used and who uses them. Uh, again, 1830 still is not that old for uh. spelling, grammar, and so on. Um, Webster did a number of school textbooks and so on, but the, the earlier ones of those are more like 1790, 1810, 18, early 1800s. And a few of those go for more, the first editions of them. But again, by 1830, there were still a lot of them. Everywhere. And they fall almost wow. into the same class as the 1870s. Yeah, wow, very interesting. Okay, yeah. but they're fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, the story part of it is also, likewise, it's, you know, I, I got these books from my great aunt who had this big old farmhouse just full of books in every, every corner and, um, exactly. Well, one, one yeah. last thing that I'll end with is a lot of times you think when you're doing appraisals, and it, like I say, hopefully we'll get back to live, live audiences sometime soon, um, and we really need that. But uh, if you think of this, normally people think, well, there'll be 30, 40, 50 people lined up with books, and most of them you're saying, well, if this has sentimental value, if this has this value, if this you know, in, in a nice way to say they're not valuable. Now, people think I'm disappointing everybody. More people in that, and some people are, but more people in that group say, fabulous. I don't have to worry about it now. I don't have to take care of it. I can read it. I can give it to the children or grandchildren. They can handle it. They can touch it. We don't have to put it in a glass case. So more people that I tell it's not worth anything are happier. Because if you say it's worth $10,000, obviously people are thrilled. But if you say it's worth fifty, dollars $100, it's not enough money to change anyone's life and they got to deal with it. So they're much happy to say, hey, it's worth a couple of bucks. Great. We don't have to worry. You freed us. <laughs> In any case, thank you. That is fantastic. Thank you so That's much. It. Thank you so much for, for well, your, your time spent with us. It's, this is a really wonderful talk. Uh, if anybody does have any extra questions well, that they just don't want recorded, please stay on after we end the recording. Um, but thank you so much for coming out. It's, it was really great for all of us to listen or, to. Or get, in, or get in touch with me directly if you want. Okay? Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Ken. Extraordinary talk. Thank you. <laughs>